Welcome to the Heart of the Matter. On today's program, we get a rare glimpse into the life of a former governor. Stay tuned. Governor Al Qui has a long history of serving others. From his earliest days, his family instilled a sense of working hard, learning from mistakes, and contributing to the greater good. Qui exemplified these traits throughout his career, in politics, in horsemanship, and in his ministry to others. Today, Governor Qui remains a valued resource to many. His counsel is sought on a variety of issues, and he remains active in his favorite pursuits. We recently had an opportunity to sit down with Governor Al Qui for a great conversation about interests near and dear to his heart. From humble but honest beginnings in 1923 on a farm near Denison, Minnesota, Albert Qui began a life of service to God and his fellow man. Qui's political life began with his election as the president of the St. Olaf Republican Club in 1946 positions on the boards of the Rice County Soil and Water Conservation District, Twin City Milk Producers Association, and the Rice County Farm Bureau followed, ultimately leading to his election as state senator, U.S. congressman, and governor of Minnesota. Qui is widely respected for his thoughtful, straightforward representation of his constituents. If ever there was an example of doing the right thing rather than the expedient thing, Governor Qui is it. Governor Cui's life after elected office has been no less full or rewarding. While his prison ministry began during his time in Congress, Cui took even more active roles with Prison Fellowship USA after leaving public office. His dedication to ministering to those in the Minnesota Correctional Facility at Lionel Lakes earned him the distinction of having a wing of the prison named in his honor. Throughout his life, Governor Cui has also managed to make time for one of his favorite pursuits, horsemanship. From one of his earliest memories, sitting atop a Morgan named Nancy, to his latest project, a young prospect in training, Hui has enjoyed a special relationship with horses. One of his most challenging endeavors was to navigate the continental divide from Canada to Mexico on horseback. Governor Al Kui, a unique leader among men, a faithful servant of God, a good friend to those in need. Governor Kui, it is an honor to visit with you today. Thanks so much for taking time to talk with us. Well, thank you. I would love to talk about a number of pieces of your life and your career, but mm. let's go ahead and start at the very beginning and tell us what it was like to grow up in a rural community in southern Minnesota. In a rural community on a farm, sometimes you're close to one town, and we were between Denison and Nurstrand, and so we went to church in Nurstrand and got our mail from Denison and went to the grocery store in both places and so forth. So I feel like I began as between big <laughs> communities and small communities. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's one. The second, the second one is at, at the time when I did, uh, and then the roads would all uh, blow shut in the wintertime. We went by sleigh. Okay. So people didn't communicate with each other mm -hmm. uh, very much. And when the Depression came, my folks took the telephone out. And so we didn't, uh, my, my folks didn't believe in listening on the party line. But uh, <laughs> there a lot of stories got passed around sure. that way. <laughs> and so when my sisters started saying, Olaf, and then they put a telephone in again. So people were poor at that time, but we never talked about it and thought, thought of that mm -hmm. as, as I re remember. It seems like rural life often shapes the values and the character of mm -hmm. young people. Did you find that to be true? And do you think young people today still experience that character building of a rural community? Well, in, in one sense, no, because we had to make our own fun. And uh, the four of us in the family and uh, uh, the children. And uh, we did not engage with other kids close by. There was no way of get, getting there. So. Uh, there, there was more learning to live by yourself and not be lonely with, with that way. Governor, you were in the Navy. Uh, yes. Tell us a little bit about how did you get in? Did, were you drafted? Did you enlist? How did that work? Well, first of all, I want to say at 12 years of age, my dad let me get a ride in a Ford Trimotor airplane in Rochester. And I said to my sister when I left that plane, by the time I'm 19, I'm going to fly my own airplane. 
And so I started reading flying magazines and everything. But then when I wanted to go into the Navy Air Corps, uh, I couldn't do it because they wouldn't take enlistments anymore. And I was frozen on the farm, so they couldn't draft me either. So I got my dad to go to the draft board and ask that I be drafted. And then I asked to transfer to the Navy. And I was in, I was in the Army for two days, and then I was over in the Navy Air Corps. Right. And then, of all things, I expected to see the world. I made it 11 miles to St. Olaf College for my first place. <laughs> <laughs> they would teach me. <laughs> what was one of your favorite memories from your time in the Navy? Well, I, uh, my favorite memories were uh, the flying itself and what, what I learned uh, with that. And uh, so I, I realized I had determination to, to make certain mm -hmm. because uh, I, uh, in order to do the dive bombing with, with the Navy dive bombers, I went lower altitude than uh, we were supposed to. And I remember I pulled out, and just before I blacked out, I saw the fence posts go by me out the side of my eye. So I know I was not very far from the ground, but I hit the bullseye every time of my bombing runs. When you first decided that you were going to consider public office, or actually you were at uh, St. Olaf mm -hmm. when you started considering party designation, uh, and you decided that you would be a Republican, what helped you make that decision? There were plenty of rural folks that became Democrats. Wh what turned you to the Republican Party instead? All the stories of my grandfather who died before I was born, who helped Lincoln get elected in his first term and being in Minnesota uh, before we were a state on, on, the, on the farm that I grew up on. And my dad would just dislike uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt and was a strong supporter of Hoover and Hoover's poster was on the chimney at the two elections in 28 and, and then 32. That's a part of it. And then, then I uh, voted when I was in the Navy the first time mm -hmm. uh, as well. And so th that's what laid the groundwork. But the other, the other part of it was uh, uh, enough of a Republican that when I was at St. Olaf, and then some uh, students came by my dorm room and, uh, and said, let's go and beat the guy who was president of the Republican Club. And I said, OK, it sounded like the revolution and fun. So <laughs> as we were walking down, I asked, who are you going to put up against him? And they said, oh, we never thought of that. Why don't you run? And so I ran, and I was elected. That's <laughs> my first <laughs> elective office. And so the, uh, uh, not too long after that, I was elected to the school board. And, and then finally, uh, it was a concern of mine of how could a person serve and follow Jesus Christ if they uh, were in politics. Because I had always heard from my relatives and everything mm -hmm. that I would either be a minister or a missionary. And I prayed to God that he wouldn't send me to China. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I heard two people say about, about Luther saying that a, pers a farmer scrubbing, I mean, a farmer pitching manure and a maid scrubbing the floor is doing as great a work in the eyes of God as a monk on his knees in the monastery. And then I knew I could do both and go into public mm -hmm. office. After your time as state senator, you became the congressman from nice. the first mm -hmm. district. You were quite effective in moving legislation early on. Mm -hmm. How were you able to do that, especially from the minority side? Yes, yeah, so I was in the minority all the time I, I was there, but I dealt with ideas. And so let's use agriculture a, as an example. And uh, uh, I would talk with the people on the agriculture committee who really know what they're talking about. And some of these old timers were. The chair really didn't. So the, <laughs> well, the, the Democrat second to that, Bob Polk, really did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he was a gruff guy. Went to dinner at his house one time, and I realized there's one person who had more authority than he did. And that's the one who cooked the dinner, his wife, <laughs> <laughs> which was fun. But we work with that. And so uh, as I looked at, for instance, at, at agriculture, we were big, having all these surpluses built up. And I knew that depressed the market. And so I wanted to get rid of that and go to the payments like we have now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was called Brannon Plant because a Democrat Secretary of Agriculture had the idea. But that didn't bother me. He had the idea. Mm -hmm. And so we got it through on the uh, House side. The Senate killed it. And, uh, and, and then in conference, they, we put it back in again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember Senator Hickenlooper of Iowa just condemning it, that's the Brandon plan, and one of the Democrat 
senator stood up. He says, yes, but the author of this is Al Quee, a Republican from Minnesota, <laughs> who was a farmer himself. In your days, uh, actually throughout your career, but in, in Congress you were kind of used to doing things a little unconventionally or you had a way of thinking outside the box and, and you went up and ran with the gangs of New York City. Why did you do that? <laughs> I wanted to understand why people went into gangs. I want to understand African Americans because we didn't have many of them. <laughs> I didn't know any of the first district, really. and uh, so. Uh, I knew that was a big power and influence in other parts of the country, so I understand it. So I uh, was talking to a person from the youth board and asked if he could set that up. And so it was, it was so dangerous that taxi cabs wouldn't go into it. So I <laughs> ran with them for three days and three nights. So, and, uh, and what happened? Uh, well, what, I wa walked with a leader, and it was amazing how he knew his people better than a, than a, a politician knew his area. And he said, see that person over there? He's, he's supposed to come and meet with me right now, but he sees you with me, and so he thinks you're police. And so this, the leader ran his numbers racket out of his, uh, out of his head. He didn't have any paper or anything, so he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. But the last night, they asked me not to come with him. And they left me standing on a street corner for two and a half hours in that part of New York. And uh, they came back. When they came back, they told me the reason why. They had gone on a rumble to take on another gang. Two of their members had been killed. Oh. And they thought enough of me, they did not want to put me in that kind of danger. You, you just have impression. to realize how dangerous it was. I left my car there, too. And they, were, they watched my car so you for went all of that time. All your wheels and your yeah, yeah, everything and was in place. And the guy who I noticed had the, that umbrella stem sharp as a razor on one end. He had evidently set people up to watch that. And we got back to the car. There he stood, proud as can be. That car was in perfect shape. So, so you reach out and you learn to respect and have honor with people, even though they've gone what I, we consider as immoral ways. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's, that's probably one of the things that enabled me to go into to prison ministry as well. You often uh, talk about you how much you enjoy congenial disputation, I think is your term. Yeah, gee, <laughs> congenial <laughs> disputation. With family, with friends, with opponents, colleagues. Mm -hmm. Do you think those involved in politi political activity today can still engage in congenial disputation? I, I think if the people are raised right with their families, because I noticed by on both my mother and father's side that the siblings engaged that way with each other. They never yelled and got angry with each other. They may continue the argument from mm -hmm. the time before because they were arguing religious issues that had been settled before I was born. A <laughs> <laughs> predestination. But here it is, you begin with the values. So you come together, they had, they had similar values. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, you look at the barriers of reaching those values, and then how are you going to overcome the values? And then those you discuss with each other, and you build it on principles, and then you look into the future and see for what's in the past how you can, how you can reach that together. And that's what brings people together. When you, when you do it, it it's, it's amazing when you get engaged in that uh, congenial disputation. Your, your faith has been something that you have shared and been open about from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. It's, people know it's a part of you and a part of your life and, and central to you. Do you feel that folks in public office today can be as open about their beliefs, particularly if they happen to be of a different religion? No, if they're basing it on their religion. Because I've, I've read uh, the Quran and so forth, and uh, and so when you look at that, uh, people read the Bible, and then they try, and God's too slow. They try to do it themselves. It'll never work that way. The only way it works is if you submit yourself to God and love that other person. Communicating with others and finding common ground is a hallmark of Governor Quees. This critical skill has served him well, particularly with one of his great passions, horses. Shortly after leaving the governor's office, Quee set out on a trip of a lifetime to ride the Continental Divide. After deciding not to run for governor, you decided you had time to pursue a long-held dream, which mm. was to ride the Continental Divide from mm. Canada to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Where did that dream come from? No, the dream came from two places. One of them was uh, my dad's sister, who was a head nurse in Children's Hospital in Seattle, and she talked about her experiences in the mountains, and uh, that just intrigued me. And the second one was, as a young person, I love reading, 
And uh, I was reading about the Arabs and their and the Arab horses, and they practically were part of the family in the in the tent. And I also thought, wouldn't that be marvelous to just spend 24/7 with your horses? And and some places as fantastic as the mountains. So the dream kept developing in my life. And finally, I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to do that when I leave office. And that's what, that's one of the reasons uh, too why I did leave the governorship. I didn't want to get so old and firm. I couldn't make that trip. <laughs> and so it was it was marvelous. And, uh, and I, I I just say, as the men who would ride with me for a two week period, mm -hmm. and uh, they would run from one to five, and they would learn then. And so I I let them learn as they went along and I would observe it. Give you an example. I brought my horses and pack horses over to where the saddles were, were, were uh, uh, stacked up and saddled them there. They couldn't understand how I got saddled up so fast. They would carry their saddles over to back into the woods of the place where the horses <laughs> were tethered because that's what they'd always done on the farm. Sure. And so I'd say to one of them, hmm, you know, why don't you take your horse over there? And then the other one would say, and then they'd talk with the other one, and pretty soon they're all doing that, getting, a, getting out of camp faster. So I love that part of building the teamwork where they come together. Mm -hmm. And I just love it that I've heard from other people, these men have said, this is the greatest experience I've ever had in my life, mm -hmm. is riding in the Continental Divide with Al Queen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that the invisible was at work in that whole experience with their, with their horses. Did you ever think you wouldn't make it? No, never did. Never did. I, uh, and, but when I uh, was close to death, uh, I, I never gave it a thought then <laughs> either. No, I was determined to, to do that mm -hmm. and ride that whole way as close to the top as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. and, and so and it, there it was a fair, fair, fair amount of tragedy and, and triumph on oh, that yeah, ride. Yeah, there sure what was. What really stuck out for you? Well, right now it's when... I was uh, not careful coming back from checking an area that the trail wasn't running and and there was quicksand there and I, my horse dropped into quicksand and uh, I had read that what you ought to do is stay horizontal so I rolled off and rolled up to the roots of a tree and, uh, and, and this horse is amazing that uh, he saw me do that now he had sunk in himself so deep that it was up to the saddle pads and he reared himself up, pulled himself out of there, turned his body, and now he sunk his rear end about, so the saddle was down uh, under the water, hooked his hoofs up by me, and pulled himself up beside me, and stood there just shaking from the exertion. And so, you know, I've just felt for what that horse, but amazed at that horse. Mm -hmm. Then I was careful the rest of the way. So sure. that's so I would, would, but you know, that those uh, things like that are, are close close to death, but horses just amazing how they care for you. Horses have been uh, a continued interest throughout your life. Mm -hmm. What makes your relationship with horses so important to you? Well, probably is that memory of my dad sending me on a Morgan mare, his first horse, to Mame Nancy, and, and the memory of that, feeling the warmth of her body, when I chubby hands on her hames, and, uh, and then he picked me off and looking back and seeing that. And so there's something in horses that really attracted me. And so as a little kid, and uh, I would go down and study them. I'd just sit on hay and watch as they interacted with each other. And so that kind of, kind of study, and I learned what you should do and shouldn't do, how they communicated with each other. Mm -hmm. then, uh, so I think that's how, how it came uh, about. What is your current horse project? Oh, the current horse project is a friend of mine who has a four-year-old colt. This year he'd be five. I started in, in uh, late summer last this year, and it's probably the most difficult horse I ever trained. Oh. And, well, how so? Uh, uh, one, he instead of giving you his hoof when you go to pick it up, he practically lift the one up on the other side so you couldn't get it up, and he'd jerk away and he would he try to lead him. He'd put on the brakes and all of those sort of, sort of things, and uh, he is so. Uh, uh, worried about things that it, he knows the safe places where you're standing, so he wants to stand where you're standing. You know, which is hard on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> does that all? The, all those things. Mm -hmm. But let me just tell you one quick thing, sure. just to give you an idea of what he has become now. I was circling him a couple of weeks ago in the arena at a gallop to the left, and so I aimed him to the wall so he would be required to do a flying change of a lead, and just as I gave him 
the uh, cue to turn right. He had turned left. But when he felt my body, which is this, to go to the right, you put your left hip down a little bit, but you can't see me even doing now, and turn my head like that. He slammed on the brakes, switched leads, and darted to the right right away. And so I just saw the lesson of that. God gives you a chance to make choices, but if you don't make the right choice, are you listening close enough so when he does indicate where the right choice is, that you'll do it? Yeah, and so, you know, I just amazed. This horse is so bright, and he learns so quick, and we have that relationship that it is really fantastic. Governor Kui has used his ability to observe, listen, and connect, not only with horses, but also with people who are often thought to be among the most unreachable, prisoners. It was a group of people with which he wasn't always interested in connecting. Governor, you are well known for your work with prison fellowship ministries, mm -hmm. but folks may not know how you got involved in that in the first place. Would you tell the story of how you were reading uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 25, and you had a little conversation <laughs> with the Lord, and how you came to, to this ministry? First, you have to know what I was like, like before that. I absolutely had nothing to do with people who did wrong. I mean, I, as a young person, I never went to pool halls, went to a bar or anything. I just stayed away from anybody who could lead me in the wrong, wrong way. And I say, until I started campaigning, then <laughs> you shake hands with people in those places too, <laughs> as well. But the uh, chief U.S. Marshal for uh, Richard Nixon had been uh, involved in the raid in Chicago, confiscated some weapons, didn't pay the tax on it, was sent to the federal penitentiary, and he was involved with a prayer group that I helped get started in the Justice Department. And so spiritually and emotionally, I turned my back on him when I did that, because I figured I wasn't going to have anybody do with that. It probably would be if some of the people in the first district knew about it, uh, that I was a friend of his, they might not vote for me too. <laughs> and, and, but that night, I had left early in the morning, I hadn't done my devotion, and so I thought, oh, I'll have two devotions tomorrow morning. And then I just something in me I said, you've got to have your devotion tonight. So I sat at the edge of the bed, Gretchen was sleeping, and with the, the bed light uh, lamp I, I read, and I had just come to 36 verse of chapter 25 about feeding the hungry. And I remember we uh, reduced our uh, income as we got started farming some to send care corn to, to Europe. Mm -hmm. So I was patting myself back well, and I came to where he said, and you visited me in prison. And uh, I said, no, you can't mean somebody who was guilty. You have to be somebody like Paul who was thrown in prison for his religious beliefs. And then I read on for those who didn't do it, and I sat there condemned. And I knew I was wrong. I had to change my ways. But I didn't know anything about doing that. So two weeks later, uh, two people came into my office in Congress one black and one white, you know, who I'd known from before, and they had with them the guy who had been the godfather of the black criminals in Washington, D.C. And I still remember, when he came in the room, I checked everything of value to make sure when he left it was still there. That's <laughs> still my attitude. Uh -huh. And he then asked me if I would go into Lorton Penitentiary, his lieutenants were still in there, and uh, lead them a Bible study and, and help them. And you said? Uh, you know, I said, yes, I'll do it because, you know, the congressman is too busy for this sort of thing, but I didn't want to fight with God again. So I said, yes. And if I had not done that, I never would have helped disciple Chuck Colson because I made sure I never went to any meeting where he was present in the White House. I, did, I just saw the shadow of Nixon, and I did not like this person, Chuck Colson. Your work uh, here in Minnesota, especially at Lionel Lakes, has earned you uh, the naming of a wing after yeah, you. that's right. You imagine right. that, all the work I did in Congress, and they give me a prison wing. <laughs> 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 What's the most important thing that you experienced when you, when you actually go in the door of the prison and you meet someone that you know, as you said, has done wrong, mm -hmm. is, is yeah. convicted? I mean, really wrong, yeah, because I, I, I mentored a person for 13 years, both in prison and out, who killed his father and his mother and his oldest sister. Mm. And, uh, and I told him, if I believed in capital punishment, you'd be the first one I'd want to have taken out on that. 
But he came to the Lord, and he, he's a good husband and a good person, living in Florida now. That's why there's a date end on that. But mm -hmm. uh, we commu communicate on email once in a while. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that that part is there. But but here's here's what it is. The first thing is to pay attention. Most people in prison and state prisons have been rejected by their father. They just hunger for the attention of their father. So an old buzzard like me pays attention to them. And then immediately they t want to connect. And then secondly, uh, with them, just bring them to where they'll tell you the whole thing of what their crime was. So they, so then they aren't holding anything back anymore. So they build that trust relationship. It takes continuity relationships to do that. Mm -hmm. So what I do is when every new class in IFI comes in, I watch them from the front. And I pick the person who I think is the most difficult person of all, and then I pay attention to that person. Because you can't, to me, I can't pay attention to the whole, whole group sure. of 30 people. So that person, and then we begin with that. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and, and I got to say, it's the hand of the Lord is in, the, in that. If it, you got time for one more thing. Let me tell you how the hand of the Lord is in that. This one guy was absolutely tougher. I mean, he, he said, the reason why he is, was he's mean. <laughs> <laughs> and he all sat with his back to the wall. And I, after 11 months, I was in there and I figured I got to get him to change from that. So I practiced what I was going to say to him came early so I could visit with him. And when I came into the room, he was sitting in the front seat. I went up to him and said, you've changed. And he said, what do you mean I've changed? And I said, you all sat back by the wall. And he said, I guess I have changed. He said, I always wanted my back covered. But since I saw you last, I asked the chaplain if he would baptize me. He said, I got somebody else covering my back now. And he was voted the guy who made the greatest change in the whole program uh, there. And so it, the thing is, is, is to listen and discern where the Lord is, is moving you. And nobody's too tough to, to work with. I think redemption is available for everyone. Governor, you have led such a wonderful life and you are continue to be a great contributor to Minnesota and to the different organizations that exist here. I thank you so much for taking oh, the time thank to you. visit with us today. Thank you. Best luck to you. Yeah. What an honor it was to visit with this truly remarkable man. The Heart of the Matter will return next week with another compelling story from our region. For Donnie Rolls, I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Good night. <laughs>